Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Bartłomiej Czaplicki. Uh, I'm a linguist. Uh, my main uh, field of interest is uh, phonology and morphology. Uh, I work at the Institute of English Studies at uh, uh, the, the University of Warsaw. Uh, and I have, to, I have the pleasure to, have this, uh, um, to give you this uh, short inaugural uh, lecture. Um, I would like to uh, talk about uh, uh, scientific uh, hypotheses uh, and uh, uh, ways to verify uh, them. Um, in this talk, I would like to um, tell you about uh, uh, 3D ultrasonography, uh, a technique uh, um, used for uh, this, uh, to, to study articulation, um, and an experiment that I uh, did with my colleagues from other uh, inst uh, universities. Um, so uh, let, let, I will be showing you uh, slides as all, um, at the same time. So let me uh, share these slides with you right now. Um, okay, I hope that you can uh, see uh, the slides now. So as I said, I'm going to talk about uh, 3D ultrasonography, a technique uh, that can be used to verify linguistic uh, hypotheses. Uh, I would like to start uh, with, um, uh, with some basic facts about uh, uh, scientific hypotheses. Um, so hypotheses, first of all, can be based on uh, intuition. Um, and uh, as you can uh, uh, probably guess, uh, this type of uh, uh, forming hypotheses is uh, subjective um, and uh, anecdotal, right? What I mean uh, by uh, um, subjective is that uh, basically everyone has uh, a different experience and uh, uh, basing, your basing your hypothesis on a single uh, case uh, would not be, uh, um, uh, would not be reliable and uh, uh, objective. So uh, anecdotal, uh, uh, the, an example of anecdotal uh, evidence uh, can be the, especially um, uh, relevant uh, today uh, because uh, in, the, uh, in the age of uh, the coronavirus, uh, you hear a lot of such anecdotal evidence. So for example, uh, you might hear from a friend of yours uh, something like, um, you shouldn't uh, be worried about uh, the coronavirus because a friend of mine uh, was inf uh, infected with the coronavirus and had uh, COVID and uh, this, he, he didn't have any symptoms, right? So this would be one uh, anecdotal uh, piece of evidence. And another uh, um, a piece of evidence could be from, a diff from another friend who would tell you that uh, the coronavirus is a serious uh, threat uh, because uh, 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 um, they know someone who had uh, the uh, COVID and uh, he barely survived um, so you should be uh, you should be very careful. So both of these uh, types of um, uh, evidence are anecdotal uh, because you cannot really form any um, universal or reliable uh, conclusions on the basis of such uh, evidence. Uh, and of course, you find a lot of such anecdotal uh, um, evidence in uh, well, especially today, uh, especially uh, when you. Uh, when you tune in to uh, what celebra various celebrities have to say uh, about things that they have no idea about. Um, so, uh, in fact, uh, scientific hypotheses uh, uh, require verification uh, using um, em empirical evidence. And um, mm, the, there are various, I mean, there, there is a, a, a range of empirical evidence um, that you can uh, distinguish for different uh, uh, fields of res research. Uh, one type would be uh, conducting experiments with uh, subjects or with speakers. Uh, another type would be observation in the lab, uh, in the laboratory. Uh, another uh, uh, type would be running statistical tests uh, on the data that you uh, gathered, uh, collected. And uh, another type would be using appropriate uh, instruments to observe uh, behavior. And of course, the, this uh, last uh, type on the list uh, is going to be the, uh, the main focus of this uh, lecture. So um, 
we are going to look at uh, studies of articulation uh, and let me just briefly uh, define what articulation is. Uh, so uh, this is a, a field of uh, phonetics uh, where you basically check uh, the position of uh, articulators, that is the speech organs, uh, during the production of particular uh, sounds. So you can talk about the position of the tongue, uh, the lips, uh, uh, the, the state of the vocal folds. Um, I think we are all uh, aware of uh, what articulation is. Um, in uh, traditional descriptions, uh, very often uh, um, uh, phoneticians uh, used uh, uh, impressionistic evidence, right? So uh, they uh, basically uh, um, shared their intuition, uh, saying that when I produce the sound uh, T, my tongue, the tip of the tongue is uh, located behind the teeth and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, this uh, type of impressionistic evidence is very often uh, unreliable uh, because it is uh, very often subjective. Uh, and uh, once again, it, it's very often based on a single uh, speaker and uh, um, we have to be aware of the fact that uh, each speaker is slightly different. We have different uh, uh, articulator. I mean, diff uh, very often uh, the vocal tract that we have uh, is different from a speaker to speaker. Uh, so basically some people have uh, larger uh, heads, uh, smaller heads and uh, larger tongues or smaller tongues. And uh, some, some of us might have uh, speech defects and so on. So. Um, Impressionistic uh, data uh, of this type uh, requires uh, verification using empirical uh, evidence. Um, okay, so uh, uh, let's briefly go over some um, methods or instrumental methods of uh, studying uh, articulation. Uh, the first uh, type, uh, uh, well, the first uh, meth instrumental method uh, used uh, to study articulation was called, uh, or is called palatography. Uh, the idea here is that you basically uh, place some dye on uh, the hard uh, palate, right, of uh, inside, in, in the mouth of the speaker. Uh, and the dye means some, some kind of coloring uh, substance. Um, and then you ask the speaker to pronounce uh, uh, some sounds uh, um, in words or individually, um, and uh, then you check uh, whether the this dye was removed uh, from particular areas in the uh, on the hard palate. Uh, so uh, this uh, this method is uh, more or less reliable because you uh, get empirical evidence. You get uh, real. Um, uh, I mean, you, you get results from actual speakers, and uh, these results are not based on intuition, but on hard uh, facts. Uh, however, there are some uh, um, shortcomings of this method. Uh, it cannot be used for all sounds, uh, because uh, uh, in order to, uh, to make this uh, method useful, uh, the particular sound needs to have uh, contact, complete contact uh, of two articulators. So for example, the tongue, uh, has to touch uh, the hard palate. Uh, and uh, uh, vowels uh, do not have uh, this, uh, this type of articulation, so this method is not useful for vowels. Uh, another thing is, of course, that it is time consuming because basically um, uh, uh, to study one sound, you have to repeat uh, the procedure uh, um, many times because uh, uh, it's useful just for one uh, occurrence, right? So for one repetition of a particular sound. So every time you want to uh, study another sound, you have to repeat the whole procedure and uh, put the die once again and so on. So it is uh, time consuming in this sense. And it is also uncomfortable for the uh, speaker because imagine that you can, you have to uh, place, uh, the, the experimenter has to uh, place their uh, uh, fingers inside the mouth of the speaker and uh, put the dye uh, on the uh, hard palate. So it's a bit uncomfortable, it's, uh, especially now. Um, uh, and uh, as, a, as a kind of a, a, a next stage in uh, palatography, uh, people have devised uh, a modified version of this, and this is called 
electropolitography. So instead of uh, using dye and uh, <clears throat> and inserting your fingers in someone's mouth, uh, you actually uh, put some uh, artificial palate inside the mouth of the speaker. And uh, in this way, it's less uh, uncomfortable and less uh, time consuming, but some of the disadvantages uh, remain. Um, the next uh, uh, method uh, is called electromagnetic arti articulography. Uh, and uh, in this method, uh, as you can see in this small uh, picture, uh, you basically place uh, sensor sensors or sensor coils on the uh, tongue and other articulators of the uh, speaker. And then you use, uh, 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 you induce electromagnetic field. Uh, this speaker has to uh, be placed in a booth or uh, under a particular device that induces this electromagnetic, electromagnetic field and then you can check the position of uh, those coils, those, those sensors. Um, uh, this uh, this uh, um, method is uh, reliable once again because you get uh, objective data. Um, you can even check articulation in real time because you don't have to remove those coils every time uh, you pronounce, uh, the speaker pronounces a, a sound. Um, it is also, it is good for vowels because uh, the position of those sensors can be studied um, without any restrictions. Uh, of course, it is a bit uncomfortable because once again, you have to place those uh, sensors in the speaker's um, uh, uh, oral cavity. Um, so uh, the next uh, method uh, actually is called uh, ultrasonography. Um, or, or ultrasound imaging. Um, the, the method uses uh, ultrasounds uh, basically to uh, test um, uh, the articulation. Uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, reliable like uh, the, the, one, the previous one. Uh, you can also use it for, to, to look uh, at articulation in real time. Uh, it is uh, 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 less, I mean, it is non-invasive in the sense that you don't have to uh, put anything into the mouth of the uh, speaker. Um, it is uh, not very time consuming and uh, it is not very uncomfortable because uh, what you can see here in this picture is me, of course. Uh, I, I was not uh, really the subject of these experiments, but uh, I wanted just to uh, see uh, and feel how this, uh, how, how this method uh, can be used. So as you can see, uh, there is this helmet that you put on uh, the speaker and uh, there is a, a um, underneath uh, your chin, there is a, a probe uh, that is used to uh, emit or emit um, uh, uh, ultrasounds, okay? And uh, this is how it uh, works. So once again, this method is uh, very uh, useful because uh, it's a, uh, not as invasive as the previous ones, and it is not uh, time consuming. Um, so um, what, uh, let's now move on to the hypothesis that I'm going to verify um, in the area of articulation. Um, um, so in the descriptions of uh, Ukrainian, um, we talk about uh, uh, two uh, fricatives. Right, uh, they are called back fricatives, and uh, let me briefly mention that uh, by fricatives uh, I mean uh, uh, continuant consonants uh, that are often hissing, not not uh, not always, but uh, very often hissing uh, sounds. So these are things like s, z, f, v, and so on. These are fricatives, and uh, in traditional descriptions of Ukrainian, uh, uh, people have. Uh, claimed that there are two uh, back fricatives in Ukrainian, that is those that are pronounced at the back of the mouth. Uh, the first one uh, appears in the word like uh, hata. So uh, as you can see, the, the symbol here is X, right? It stands for H. This, uh, by the way, this fricative is similar to the, the one in Polish. We also have a similar articulation of the word uh, hata. And uh, the second one is, uh, is, uh, appears in words like harno, right? I, I may not be pronouncing this uh, uh, accurately, but uh, the description uh, is as follows. So the, uh, the first one, the one in Hata, is described as a voiceless velar uh, fricative. Uh, here we use the back of the tongue to produce this fricative. Uh, the second one is called, uh, is called a voiced glottal fricative. Um, 
Uh, and in this case, we don't use uh, the back of the tongue. Uh, this, uh, this sound is produced uh, with the vocal cords uh, mostly, so uh, the, the, uh, the, the tongue is not used uh, during the production of this sound. If you want to hear uh, this uh, sound pronounced accurately, you have to uh, ask uh, a Ukrainian native speaker to uh, produce uh, a word like harno, okay? Um, Okay, so uh, according to other descriptions, uh, actually I'm talking about my description from a very long time ago. Um, that is, um, I uh, actually claimed that uh, the voiceless one is Wheeler, right? Uh, uh, in line with the previous descriptions, but I actually uh, claimed that the voiced one has two positional variants. Um, and uh, this, these two positional variants appear in two contexts. At the beginning of the syllable, uh, it's called the onset of the syllable. Uh, the, the, the voiced fricative is glottal, so uh, harno. However, uh, I also uh, claimed that at the end of the syllable, that is in the coda of the syllable, uh, the fricative, uh, the voiced fricative, fricative is velar, right? So uh, in the, an example would be uh, bor, right, with a, a velar fricative. Uh, however, I now uh, as, uh, admit that these, uh, this uh, description was impressionistic and because it was fully based on my perception. So I basically listened to uh, uh, several Ukrainian speakers and asked them to pronounce uh, words of this type. And uh, then I uh, um, based, uh, I mean, I formulated the hypothesis that actually these two positions in the syllable uh, condition two different uh, places of articulation of the, uh, of the voiced uh, fricative. So uh, now I see that uh, this was not uh, sufficient uh, evidence to, um, to come to any conclusions. So in, the, uh, in this ultrasound uh, uh, study, uh, I would like to present some experimental evidence that uh, uh, in order to verify the hypothesis that I formulated uh, 14 uh, years ago. Uh, I'm going to, to see whether the voiceless fricative is velar in all positions and whether it is true that the voiced one is glottal in the onset and velar in the coda. Uh, how, uh, so the, the specific hypothesis is going to be uh, that for the voiceless fricative, uh, marked as uh, X here, of course, uh, as you can see, uh, we expect raising of the back of the tongue in all positions. Uh, um, on the other hand, for the voiced uh, fricative, um, if the, the hypothesis is, is uh, confirmed, uh, we uh, expect two positional variants. We expect uh, raising of the back of the tongue in the coda, uh, re, and no raising of the back of the tongue in the onset of the syllable. So once again, coda stands for uh, uh, the end of the syllable and uh, onset stands uh, for the beginning of a syllable. So uh, um, ultrasound imaging is uh, useful in uh, um, studying the dynamicity of the back of the tongue in the articulation of the fricatives in various positions. Uh, the general predictions uh, are as follows. If uh, the back of the tongue should be raised from its neutral position for the velar fricative and no raising is expected for the glottal fricative. Um, I uh, conducted this experiment with uh, my colleagues from uh, Indiana University, uh, Maugosha Chavar and Abdallah Al-Faifi, and uh, um, um, the experiment uh, looked as follows. We used uh, six speakers from Eastern and Western Ukraine living in the US uh, currently. Uh, we used uh, the program called uh, WASL in uh, MATLAB uh, de developed by Stephen uh, Lulich and others. Um, in uh, the experiment, uh, we looked at real words. Um, the, the, as you can see here, so we looked at the, the fricative uh, either voiceless and voiced in the onset and in the coda. And we looked at the context of six vowels uh, that are found in Ukrainian, uh, a, e, i, o, u, e. Um, we looked at, uh, just to give you an example of what type of words, we looked at uh, 
Mm, so we looked at, uh, for example, Hata and Puch. This is the voiceless fricative. And we also looked at uh, Harno and Bog, right? And uh, uh, you can notice that uh, different vowels uh, are also used here. Because uh, it's, a, uh, it's possible that uh, the vowel will also uh, have uh, um, influence on the articulation of the particular fricative. So this is the, the cool stuff, uh, I, I think. Uh, this is uh, the ultrasound image that you get um, from uh, this uh, machine. And uh, of course, you have to be able to read it, um, right? So this comes with experience. Uh, but uh, let me just show you. So uh, the right of this image shows the, uh, the front of the mouth. And uh, the back of the, uh, I mean, the left side shows uh, the back of the mouth. And uh, somewhere uh, in the middle of this uh, image, you see this yellow line. It's not very clear because uh, this is what you what you can expect in ultrasound uh, images. Um, so it's not very clear, but you can see the shape of the tongue, right? This yellow line, uh, the top line, represents uh, the shape of the tongue. Um, and as you can see here, the back of the tongue, which is more towards the, the uh, left of this image, um, re is raised from its neutral position. And somewhere on top of this uh, image, you, uh, there is the hard palate, right? It's not visible here, but uh, you can imagine that it's there. Um, so this uh, represents the shape of the tongue, the image that you get from uh, this uh, uh, machine. And uh, there are various interesting things that you can do with such images. Uh, I mentioned uh, maybe briefly that this is a 3D ultrasound imaging, so you can actually get 3D uh, renderings of uh, the shape of the tongue. So this is what we got when we uh, analyzed the velar uh, place of articulation. Um, uh, you can see uh, the, the blue color stands for lower position of the tongue and uh, the yellow one stands for higher position of the tongue. So as you can see, uh, the, the back of the tongue is raised uh, in this case. Now uh, let's compare this with the glottal, uh, um, where the, with the position of the tongue for the glottal uh, fricative. Here the tongue is not doing anything uh, special, so the position of the tongue is relatively low, um, as you can see, but the only way to compare them would be to overlay one on top of the other. And uh, here you, you see uh, the, the lower shape uh, is the glottal fricative, right? Uh, and the, the higher shape uh, uh, represents the velar uh, fricative. So as you can see, uh, there is a clear difference in the articulation of uh, velar sounds and glottal sounds. Um, so this was the cool stuff, uh, very nice uh, um, images that you can get uh, from this uh, uh, method. And this is the real um, data that you have to deal with. So um, here you will, s uh, this is uh, one, speaker one, we call the speaker one because we cannot use the names, of course. Um, but uh, this, these, uh, these are the different uh, shapes of the tongue uh, in the context of the vowel A for the different uh, fricatives and also in the different syllable positions. So let me go over this very quickly. So the black uh, sh line, a dotted line, stands for the articulation of the vowel A, okay? Um, this is the shape of the tongue uh, when you articulate the vowel A. And now the, so this is more or less neutral position for the vowel. And uh, when you look at the, mm, red uh, line, this, uh, this is the marked as um, uh, ha, right? So actually ha. Th so this stands for the voiced uh, fricative. And as you can see in the onset, that is ha, uh, the shape of the tongue or the position of the tongue is similar to the position of the tongue as for the vowel a. And this was what you would expect because this uh, fricative is glottal, right? So there is no raising of the tongue. However, for uh, the uh, coda position, this is the pink uh, color. Um, in the coda, on the other hand, you can see raising of the tongue, right? So ah, uh, uh, you can see raising. Um, 
Uh, the similar raising can be found for uh, the voiceless fricative, both in the onset position and in the coda position. So uh, as you can see, uh, the, um, only the, uh, the, the voiced fricative uh, in the onset is different um, from the three other positions. So this indicates that uh, in the, uh, um, so the velar fricative is velar, right? The voiceless fricative is velar. However, the glottal one is only glottal in the onset. It is the velar in the coda for this speaker. Uh, let's look at uh, another speaker. Of course, as I mentioned before, every speaker, uh, you expect different, slightly different results from every speaker because we are not the same. And uh, there are some differences in, the, in how we articulate uh, sounds. So uh, for speaker four, uh, the situation is as follows. Once again, the black uh, color uh, indicates position for the vowel A. Ah, and um, then we see the glottal one. This is marked in red. Um, the position is um, slightly raised, but not as raised as for uh, the, uh, the, um, the glottal one in the coda, right? So when you compare uh, red with pink, you will see that uh, red is slightly lower than uh, pink, right? The pink line. And um, mm, of course, there is also this uh, issue of uh, uh, the, the front back position of, these, uh, of, of, the, of the tongue here, but we're, we're not going to go into that. Um, so, um, uh, so this, these are individual speakers, and uh, in order to uh, give, get some uh, more objective results, uh, you have to look at all speakers, of course, that's uh, the, the idea, but also you have to uh, come up with a one, one uh, um, uh, measure uh, that can be used to, uh, to uh, verify whether the, the difference is there or not. So I used, uh, we used uh, the difference between uh, coda and onset, uh, and this was cal calculated in the following way. We subtracted uh, height uh, onset from uh, height coda, and uh, the idea is that if the difference between coda onset is large, this means that the fricative uh, is velar in the coda and glottal in the onset. If, on the other hand, the difference uh, between coda onset is small, it means that the fricative is articulated in the same way in the coda and in the onset. This maybe sounds a bit complicated, but uh, let's look at real uh, examples. So uh, this is uh, the coda, the difference between coda onset uh, calculated for speaker one. As you can see, we use uh, the, the blue uh, color stands for uh, the voiceless fricative and uh, the red color stands for a glottal fricative. And uh, we, uh, uh, we looked at six, uh, all six vowels. And uh, just take a look at uh, the first vowel uh, shown here. This is the vowel A. Ah. And uh, for the blue, that is the voiceless fricative, the difference between coda onset is not that great. However, for the voiced fricative uh, marked in red, the voiceless is, the, the difference is much, much uh, larger. Um, the same uh, is true for the vowel E. Uh, for the vowel E, the difference is, the difference is not that uh, uh, big, uh, right, between the two fricatives, but uh, for E, uh, there is a huge difference. So, um, so um, we see uh, that, at least for speaker one, um, the, fric the voiced fricative uh, shows slightly different behavior than the voiceless fricative. Uh, this is the same thing, but, use, uh, but shown in a graph, uh, in a line graph. Uh, the red line stands for the voiced fricative, and the blue line stands for the voiceless one. And uh, as you can see, for all vowels, the red line is slightly higher than the blue line, which indicates that the difference between coda onset is uh, uh, larger for the voiced fricative than the voiceless fricative. Um, this is speaker four. And uh, once again, when you look at, uh, compare uh, the blue with the red, you will notice that almost for all cases discussed here, uh, the 
the, uh, the voiced fricative, that is the red one marked here, has a higher or, or a larger difference than the voiceless one. Um, and as I said before, in order to uh, verify this hypothesis, you have to look at uh, many speakers at the same time uh, because uh, of various things that we are different, everyone is different and everyone pronounces things in a slightly different way. But when you look at many speakers, you'll get your results will be more uh, objective. So here uh, I used a, a box plot to show uh, that for all speakers, uh, once again, red uh, is used for the voiced fricative and blue is used for um, uh, the uh, voiceless fricative. And uh, when you look at these uh, box, uh, boxes, you will see that uh, the difference between coda and onset is uh, almost always um, larger for the voiced fricative than uh, for the voiceless one. For, all, uh, for almost all vowels. Uh, well, the difference is not that different for uh, not, not that large for the vowel E, as you can see here, but uh, there is an explanation for that. We're not going to go into that. Um, okay, so I would like to uh, draw some uh, conclusions. Uh, so the, from this uh, study here, uh, it is clear that the velar fricative, the voiceless fricative is velar in all positions, um, and the glottal one, uh, the glottal one is uh, the voiced one, I should say, is uh, glottal in the onset because there is no tongue, tongue raising, and velar in the coda because there is some tongue uh, raising. Uh, and of course, there are there are some other uh, conclusions that you can also results that you can also uh, um, take from this. And uh, there there are larger differences in the uh, tongue height for vowels a, e, o than for e, u, e. Um, so uh, the, um, the hypothesis that I formulated 14 years ago has been uh, largely confirmed uh, using ultrasonography. Uh, the voiced fricative has two positional variants. Uh, the glottal one appears in the onset and the velar one appears in the coda. Uh, so we can say that the traditional description of Ukrainian has been updated uh, using ex uh, empirical uh, evidence. Uh, so uh, this is actually true uh, for, for the uh, glottal fricative. Uh, so H is velar in the coda and glottal in the onset. So this is a, a kind of successful thing because uh, in experimental um, studies, you never know what you're going to get. So we were happy to get this. And uh, let me just mm, uh, finish this sh sh uh, short talk by uh, mentioning that ultrasonography uh, can be used, uh, as I sh have shown here, uh, to study articulation uh, and description of uh, languages, um, but it can also be used uh, in speech uh, pathology, uh, especially uh, with children, basically because then we, we can be sure uh, about speech defects, and uh, if we are sure about the speech defect, then we can use some uh, um, um, some ways to uh, eliminate uh, those uh, speech defects from children. And uh, with this, I would like you, I would like to thank you. This is the end of this short lecture. I hope you, I hope you, you have enjoyed it. And I hope to see you maybe in person or online uh, uh, this semester or the next semester. Uh, uh, thank you very much.